right, good afternoon. We welcome you to um, School of Ministry class, lesson number 10, Living by Faith for Sunday, May the 3rd, 2020. I just want to go over a couple of announcements real quickly with you and remind you that we do have Saturday Soaking Prayer uh, tomorrow evening in the Sanctuary at 7, and then also our drive-in church for this Sunday at 10 a.m. And so please uh, also uh, take note that Pastor Greg, Pastor Josue, Pastor Gurley are all putting out weekly devotionals, uh, live stream um, messages, Facebook messages. Uh, Pastor Gurley is doing three Bible studies, live Bible studies on Facebook each week. And uh, you can interact with him in those uh, there's uh, daily recordings from Pastor and Sylvia. Uh, so we're all out there. Please take advantage of all of the lessons and all the material uh, that we have uh, available for you. Uh, just know that, that we miss you. We love you. Uh, we can't wait to be together again. Uh, we are monitoring very closely uh, the multiple sources of information about what's going on in our state and our nation and looking at when maybe we can maybe reopen uh, in phases. We haven't heard that from our governor yet about what those phases will be and what those numbers and dates will be, but uh, we, we have prepared scenarios for all of those eventualities. And uh, so we love you and we miss you. Uh, today's lesson is the second lesson from the go uh, the, uh, the, uh, regarding the gospel in the book of Galatians. But this is the lesson number two of that, uh, lesson number 10, totally in the quarterly. And uh, we will uh, proceed through. We've got two, three more lessons, and, uh, and then we'll have a uh, lesson on Pentecost Sunday as well. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3. And while you're doing that, we're going to pray. And just ask the Lord to bless his word and our time together today. Father, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, the anointing and power of your word. And Father, Lord, for your ever presence that's with us that we feel so yes. closely. Amen. We thank you, Father, Lord, for our relationship with you. We thank you, Father, Lord, for um, the depth of that relationship. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for yes. meeting the needs of your people. We thank you, Father Lord, for answers to prayer. Yes. And we just pray, Father Lord, for those that are in the hospitals, Lord, those who yes. uh, are dealing with COVID, Father, in our communities around us here on the peninsula. We just pray for a flattening of that. We pray, mm -hmm. Father Lord, just that, that you would uh, drive this virus from our area. We pray, Father Lord, it just dry up in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father Lord, for uh, the strategies and technologies and things that we have in place that we yes. can share your word. We thank you, Father Lord, for the opportunity to, to reach all different age groups and all different uh, elements of our congregation. And we thank you, Father Lord, for uh, them tuning in and listening. And yes. Father Lord, for uh, receiving your word, Father Lord, may it go forth, Lord. It's, it's, it's not so much, Father Lord, that we're here as much as that your word goes forth and that we attune our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray, Father Lord, that we may be separated by distance today. We may be socially distant, but your word is not distant from us. Your spirit is not distant from us, Lord. We know that, that your presence was within us because of that relationship we have yes. with you. We give you praise. We thank you, Father Lord, for the answers to prayer. Yes. We thank Amen. you for the anticipated answers to prayer, yes. for those things and needs among our people and our congregation. Bless your word. Touch this time, Father Lord, as we come together in your word in Galatians chapter 3. Give us insight into your word and into our daily lives today. Yes. And we give you praise and thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Again, we'll read uh, Galatians chapter 3, and I'd like, if you would, to read verses 1 through 9. Follow along with me. O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made, as, was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? 
after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so, so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. As we mentioned last week in our introductory lesson to the book of Galatians and this unit of study on Galatians, uh, we talked about how that, that Paul had, had uh, preached the message of the gospel in the churches in Galatia. Uh, most of his ministry was in southern uh, Galatia. Remember, Galatia is a province, the central province of Asia Minor, or what we call the Tur nation of Turkey today. And, and Paul, we talked about in chapter 1, chapter 2, what we did last week was talking about how that salvation is found only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That you should not believe other gospels, other messages. Don't believe false gospels. Right. Uh, resist hypocrisy. So today's lesson is, he's just warning them, you need to beware of false gospels and, and you need to live by faith and the only faith you have is in the Lord Jesus Christ right. so the gospel had been preached to the uh, Galatians Paul had preached it his team had preached it the truths of the gospel were clearly on display before their spiritual eyes they had seen the fruit of the message of the one true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ they had seen the fruit they had experienced the fruit in their own lives right and so we see that he, he, he very bluntly calls them foolish. Oh, you foolish Galatians. Mm -hmm. You know, he calls them foolish because what they're doing is that they're actually falling away from the one true gospel for right. another gospel. Right. And that gospel said that faith in Christ was not enough to obtain salvation or eternal life. So false teachers were actually convincing the Galatian Christians Mm -hmm. that they needed, not only did they need Christ, but in order to earn their salvation, they would have to obey the elements of the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul reminds the Galatians in this lesson that Abraham believed God and that God counted it as righteousness unto him or justified Abraham because he believed God. Right. That was hundreds of years before the law of Moses was ever given to the Israelites. Right. So Abraham was justified or made right with God or saved by God by faith centuries, centuries before the law of Moses was ever given. That same principle applies and works for us today. Now, we see from reading the New Testament that Jesus and the apostles were very biblical preachers. Think about that for a moment. They were biblical. But what Bible did they preach? What Bible did Jesus preach? What Bible did the apostles preach from? Only the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. Right. So some scholars say that there are more than 2,000 references uh, to the Old Testament scriptures in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And we know that to be true because we know that the Old Testament is found, uh, it's fulfilled in the New Testament. Correct. So the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, he cited the Old Testament more than a dozen times. Wow. Galatians is only six chapters long. It's a little letter. It's only six chapters, a couple pages, three pages. And in 12 times he quotes the Old Testament. That's the scripture they had. 
A well-known example of this is found in the chapter we're looking at, and that's chapter 3, verse 11. And that, that, that verse actually tells us, uh, is, is very familiar to us. Let me, I haven't read it yet, but let me read it to you. It says, So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, It is through faith that a righteous person has life. For the scriptures say... Paul is quoting Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Okay? So he's using the Old Testament as evidence and proof of his message and what he's trying to relate to the Galatian Christians here. This verse is so important that Paul not only quotes it, but he also quotes it again in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and the writer of Hebrews quotes it, Habakkuk 2, 4, in chapter 10, verse 38. Not only did they they have the the scripture the old testament scripture but they also had the direct word of god himself god himself yeah. spoke to them yes yes and all of the prophets yes look at all the prophets yes okay so so there is no lack of communication from our heavenly father amen. to his creation amen there's no lack of that so in verses 1 through 5 now uh, we're talking about point number one of the lesson that we are to re re we receive the Spirit by faith. Paul brings up specifically, he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, how in the world could you leave the one true gospel and now start to believe that in, not, in addition to believing in Christ, you've got to go back and fulfill not only the moral and ethical law, uh, laws, uh, commands of the Old Testament, but also the ritual and sacrificial laws yes, yes. of the Old Testament. And, and he said, how can you be so foolish? And then he, he points out this very dramatic point. He said, how did you get the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. how, you received the Holy Spirit. He fell on you. Mm -hmm. how, how did the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit fall on you? Did you do it because you earned it? Is it something you earned? Is it something you did? And so he brings this out. And, and many of these Galatian Christians were being drawn away from the truth of the true gospel, the one true gospel, by these false teachers. In the King James, it says, Who hath bewitched you? The New Living Translation says, Who's cast an evil spell on you? Okay. So Paul is asking, you know, the, the, uh, the answer is obvious, right. but he raises the question to point mm -hmm. out the, mm -hmm. this, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the um, seriousness of this, of this nature and, and the question. But he says, you know, you keep, the false teachers keep drumming into the Galatian Christians the, that they've got to keep the ceremonial aspects of the law of Moses. And what that really is doing is that they're taking their attention away from the one true gospel, your faith in Christ, and putting it back on your own involvement, your own ability to perform, meeting your own requirements. In other words, you are working toward your own salvation. In other words, they were, they were either trying to, one of two things, trying to usurp the authority of Christ himself or to pollute the, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. the, the word of Moses, the law. Yeah. And, and, and it, polluting the law is if they're saying in addition to the law, you can also believe in Christ. So the flip is also true. That's correct. Okay. So Paul asked the Galatians, he said, how, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Was it by keeping the law, or was it by believing in the gospel in verse 2? And by obeying the, the words of Jesus Christ right. to wait in, in, uh, 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 in the upper Terry room, until, in the upper room right, until you receive. Right. Yeah. So there's multiple evidences that, that you've received it because of the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience. Obedience and believing. And notice it, but it's not obedience to the law. Yes. It's obedience yes. to the command of Christ. Exactly. Right? But it's also based on truly, the only way is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You have to by faith accept that he died for you. You have to believe by faith that he cleansed and forgiven you of your sins. Amen. It's by the fact of that faith that he's done that for you. It's not by, by your obedience to a law okay, right. or laws or commands. So notice, in addition to this, Christians can and should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, 
the fullness of the Holy Spirit subsequent to regeneration. So all of these blessings come by your faith in Christ, and they cannot be earned by doing good deeds. Correct. And that's what these false teachers were teaching the, the Galatians. Right. You can't get the Holy Spirit by participating in a ritual. You cannot uh, receive the Holy Spirit by participating in ceremonies that are prescribed by the law of Moses. The Galatians had experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives in a very unmistakable way. Paul reminded them that the Spirit worked in them because of faith, not because of a result of following the law. That's what he talks about in verse 5. So we've got some Galatian Christians here that are really misguided. Amen. Okay? And, and they weren't depending on Christ for spiritual growth. There you go. They were depending on their own accomplishment yes. of trying to live up to the law, getting, or the commands of the law. Getting the cart before the horse. Yeah. In other words, Paul asks them, how have you become spiritually mature? Yeah. Are you, are you made mature by your own efforts in the flesh? Or are you made uh, 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 mature because you've begun your life in the Spirit? And so in other words, let's put it this way. If you are trying to earn your salvation, uh -huh. you're looking at self-righteousness. Correct. Correct. Not righteousness as counted unto you by God. There you go. Okay? And so spiritual uh, uh, or self-righteousness will never produce spiritual growth. Amen. Amen. It will never do that. Only by faith in Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit can spiritual growth occur in us. Amen. So if the Galatians would not return, would not return to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the basis of their relationship with God that all of their experiences as Christians, including their suffering for Christ, mm -hmm. okay, all mm -hmm. of that would be in vain. Right. After God had done so much for them and in them. What a loss. Okay. Yeah, powerful loss. Thus you can understand the emotion of Paul's question yeah. in verse 1, yeah. or statement in verse 1. Oh, you foolish Galatians. Yeah. yeah. Who has cast a spell, a evil spell, mm -hmm. on you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's look at verses six through nine. He's, he brings out the example now of Abraham. In Genesis chapter fifteen, verse five, God gave Abraham. Now remember, Abraham was elderly; he was way up in age, and he still had not had any children. Right. So God gave Abraham an amazing promise that he would have descendants as countless as the stars, okay? Mm -hmm. He's elderly, past the time of childbearing, and we see that he is also childless when this happens. Now, Paul, knowing this, cites the very next verse, verse 6 of chapter 15, chapter and he says... Chapter 3. No, in Genesis 15, 6, oh, Paul is referring to, in chapter 3, verse 6, yes. he's referring to uh, Genesis 15, 6. He says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Amen. Okay? So Paul, in chapter 3, verse 6, quotes Genesis 15, 6. Yes. Okay? And he's noticed, he says, <laughs> it was counted because Abraham believed God. Even though Abraham was an old man, he was past the time of cherub bearing, he had no children, yet he believed the promise of God. Can that okay. word believed also mean trusted? Yes. Yes. Most definitely there's an element of trust in that belief. Yes. Amen. So God's promise to Abraham of countless descendants is fulfilled for the most part by those who receive the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Jews are genetically descendants of Abraham. However, all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord also become children of God. And we are reckoned, that's an accounting term, we've talked about that before, we are reckoned to be the children of Abraham. That's mentioned in verse number 7 and also in John chapter 1 verse 12. As like 
uh, Abraham was made right with God. Abraham was justified by God by faith. He believed God. Mm -hmm. God then reckoned unto him righteousness, okay, counted it unto him as righteous. God did that with Abraham years, many centuries before the law of Moses was ever given Yes, uh, through Moses. Now, believers in Christ are then justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God promised Abraham that all families of the earth would be blessed through him. That's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Paul cites that same promise of God, and he said that the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify. In other words, all families of the earth would be blessed. Paul says, oh, that includes Jew and Gentile. Yes. Okay? So the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, the heathen, by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, you know, In you, all nations, all families, not just all Jewish families, but all nations, Amen. all families, Amen. shall be blessed. This promise was fulfilled uh, by God sending Jesus Christ. And guess who Jesus Christ is? He is a descendant of Abraham Amen. to be the Savior of the world. Okay? And we are blessed then with faithful Abraham. Now our justification and, and our eternal salvation are not rewards for doing good deeds. Good point. Our justification and our salvation are gifts. They're blessings from God for our believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. So it is very good for us that God has made our justification and our salvation dependent on what he does for us, uh -huh. not on what we do for ourselves Amen. Okay? or what we try to do. How, how is it that we, you, have you tried to justify yourself? Were you successful? Okay, all right. So he knows, God knows that we cannot. We may try to justify ourselves, but we know that we cannot justify ourselves before God. I justified myself before man, but not before yeah, God. Yeah. God delivers on his promises because we cannot. Amen. Good point. We cannot deliver on the promises. We can try to justify ourselves, but yeah. we can't. Yeah. Now, let's look at verses uh, 10 through 14. Let's read those together. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, It is through faith that a righteous person has life. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Amen. Verse 11 that's a back at 2-4 again. This way of faith is very different from the way of the law, which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. That's Leviticus chapter uh, 18, verse 5, what's quoted there. But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Through Jesus Christ, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, mm -hmm. so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Hallelujah. In this passage, we're now going to point number two, and that we need to reject reliance on the law. Okay? And we do that because we understand that the law does not justify. The law points out our sin. Oh, it points out our need for a Savior, but it does not justify us or make us right in the eyes of God. It's the tool God uses to show us we're sinful. Good point. We still have laws today that guide us, that show us, the things that we should and should not right. do. And right. if we disobey those laws, punishment is enacted. Right. Yeah. So we have the law, uh, the, 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 the law of Jesus Christ, his word, the gospel, 
that brings us into everlasting life. Right, right. Just for clarification point, when we talk about the law here, we're talking about, in this lesson, we're talking about the law of Moses. Right. Containing the 613 commandments of God in the books through Genesis through Deuteronomy. Right. Now, I want to point out something. At the time that Paul is writing this letter to the Galatians, <clears throat> not more than a year before, Paul had, uh, uh, had, a, had been in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Conference. Mm -hmm. This is talked about in Acts chapter 15. And this is the conference where the Jewish Christian leaders and the Gentile Christian leaders came together and decided on what the Gentile Christians should do. Yes. Okay? Yes. And so it was decided that the Gentile believers in Christ would be required to adhere only, only to the moral and ethical commandments of the law. This is found in Acts chapter 15 verse 24 through 29. That's a very powerful and important note yes. that you just yeah. brought out there, yeah. Mr. Rush. Now, let me, I want to be very deliberate and I want to slow down and I'm going to be slower here in what I'm about to say. Christians are not obligated notice my language. Christians are not obligated to obey commandments in the law that have to do with temple worship animal and other sacrifices, mm -hmm. circumcision, ceremonies, and rituals, and the observance of the Jewish Sabbath. We're not obligated. No, I did not say we don't or not commanded to do that. Right. We're not obligated to do that. Right. Now, let me point something out. Of the 613 laws in the book of the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. It turns out that all of the 319 moral and ethical commandments that are in that 613, all 319 are found in the New Testament. All 319 moral and ethical commandments are included in the New Testament. Why? For Christians to obey. Okay? But not obey for our salvation. Okay. All right? Okay. We're to obey them. We are all obligated to obey these commandments of God. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 tells us that. Now, the whole issue about the law in the letter to the Galatians and elsewhere in the New Testament is that we cannot bring ourselves into a right relationship with God right. and save ourselves from sin right. by obeying the law. Okay. That's the whole point. Simply because... Nobody can perfectly obey the law. Correct. Correct. Nobody. Only one person has done that, and that is Jesus Christ. Exactly. He did it so that we have salvation through faith in him. Amen. Now, the only way to salvation is by grace. What is grace? It is undeserved. It's unmerited. Favor unearned, undeserved favor that's extended to us by God. Through what? That word you mentioned a moment ago. Through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. to be our Savior and to be our Lord. We cannot, This is also talked about, Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. So then God, for Christ's sake, because of what Christ has accomplished, uh -huh. God honors Christ's actions Amen. All right, and for his sake, he extends his saving grace to wow. us. Mm. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve yes. it, yes. but because of what Christ has done uh, for us. Now, in verses 13 through uh, 14, we see that Christ has redeemed us, and that's what Paul's making the point, in that no person can perfectly obey all the commandments of God. The consequence is that the law condemns you as sinners. Mm -hmm. Because you can't keep the law, then the law condemns you as a sinner. Okay. Okay? All right? Now, that means then that, but still though, the law cannot save us from sin. Right. The law points it out. So, this is what is meant when it says the condemnation wow. is the curse of the law. Yeah. yeah. For every person, because we've all sinned. So, the con 
the result of us knowing we can't obey the law and keep it Therefore, the condemnation is, is that we have that curse on us. We can't obey it, right. and lost. we can't fulfill it. We're lost, okay? Yeah. So the dilemma would be, would, could cause despair. If you think, well, wait a minute, yeah. I've got yeah. a law, yeah. I've, got a, yeah. I've, got, I've got the commandments of God, uh -huh. and yet I can't keep them, uh -huh. so I'm in a dilemma. How do I get out of it? Right. Well, the dilemma is, is that it, what verse 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being yeah. made a curse for us. Yes. Christ took our punishment. Hallelujah. He took our sins yeah. upon him. Amen. He came to earth in human form. He took all of the, in the incarnation, he, he laid down all of his glory, all of who he was in heaven. He laid all that down to become like us. Right. So this reference is, is that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, because he made, he was made a curse for us. There you go. Okay, all right. In other words, curses everyone that hangeth on the tree. So this is the reference of Christ being crucified on a cross for our sins. In other words, Christ has redeemed us from the law. Okay, mm -hmm. we're no longer no longer under the condemnation of the law. For now, we are living by that saving grace Hallelujah. of God through Christ our Lord. Amen. So. Let me, let me rephrase this another way. In the simplest terms, legalism is the attempt to be justified in God's sight yes. by obeying the laws and rules and doing good deeds. Yes, yes. Legalism fails because no one can ever be good enough to earn from God justification and salvation. Amen. The Protestant reformer Martin Luther said this, quote, the first step of the Christian life is by faith. The second step is by faith. And every step to the end of the journey is a step Amen. by faith. Sadly, some people who've been saved by faith in Christ have made a good start in their Christian living by faith. Sometimes fall into legalism in their zeal to be more righteous. The truth is, those who are in fact made righteous in God's sight are those who live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for righteousness, not by legalism. So perhaps by what we've just read then the, by, about the law and it's impossible for man to keep the whole law, all right, if he breaks one, the scripture says he's broken the whole law. If that's the case, maybe that's why we often hear, I have no hope. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't understand grace. Amen. They don't understand grace. And that leads us into the next part of the lesson. Let's look at verse 15 through 18. The law and God's promise. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. Child, single. Okay? All right? And notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ mm. is the descendant of who was the child yes. of Abraham, yes. who was able to bring justification and eternal life. Amen. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. Wow. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. All right? You, you, you remember the question, which came first? Chicken or the, the egg. The chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to ask you a version of that right here. Which came first? Chicken had to come first. Which came first? The promise or the law? The promise came first. Right. The promise came first. Right. 
So Paul say that louder so they can yeah. hear that. The promise came mm. first. Yes. Not the law. Amen. The promise. 430 years mm. before the law, Hallelujah. the promise came. Yeah. Amen. So Paul is continuing his teaching that justification by grace through faith preceded, came before the law, yes. and it supersedes the law. Hallelujah. And it supersedes the law. So Paul says that no one can alter or make void a legally established covenant or an agreement like we said in the New Living Translation. So then, the covenant that God established with Abraham centuries before the law was given by, to Moses uh -huh. uh, could not be made void by the covenant God made with Israel with the law. Wow. Wow. God made a covenant with Abraham. The covenant he made with a uh, Moses 430 years later, one covenant didn't break the other covenant. Exactly. Okay? The promise came first. Right. The promise God made to Abraham is here what we're talking about. It implies the blessing of all of the great salvation we have in faith in Christ. So that word you used earlier, Dad, by, by trusting in Christ, the blessings of the promise God made to Abraham pass on to all who believe in the Amen. Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. So therefore, the benefits of the promise... Now, think of the benefits of the promise as an inheritance. My, my, my. Okay? Cannot be obtained by obedience to the law, but only by faith, only by believing the promise that God made to Abraham. To only one branch of Abraham's descendants did God guarantee the, prom the, the promised grant, that which would originate from his great descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen, okay. amen. Okay. So the covenant to bless all nations points to Abraham's seed, meaning Jesus Christ. Yes. Verse 19. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the mm -hmm. law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Right. Now a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Think on that for a minute. God used the angels as mediators to give the law to Moses. God gave the promise to Abraham directly. Okay? Notice this. Yes. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not, Paul says in verse 21. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. Mm -hmm. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. We understand very clearly here that Paul is telling us the purpose of the law. Seeing that the law cannot save anyone, then he asks the question, why was it given to Israel by God then? In the first if it can't save you, then why did he give it to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did he give it to us? And he tells us in verse 19, the law was given because of human sinfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Amen. we're sinful and we live in sin, we needed something to show us we live in sin. There you go. Okay? There you go. And that we are sinful. So until Jesus, the Messiah, came, the law serves at, served as a constant reminder to Israel, the Jews, of their sinfulness, their mm -hmm. human sinfulness. Mm -hmm. okay? But also reminded them, the law reminded them, that the Messiah was needed to redeem the people from the condemnation of the law. Mm -hmm. The condemnation of the law is that the law tells you you're a sinner and therefore you deserve to die. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That's mm -hmm. the condemnation. Mm -hmm. But Christ came to free us from that condemnation. And give us life. Okay, give us life. So the law still serves a purpose of showing that all have sinned and that that in all uh, that excuse me, I'm saying it backwards, and that all fall short of the glory of God. Right. Okay. And to be honest with you, we fall short of obeying the law. Amen. Amen. We can't keep the law. Right. We can't obey it. Yep. But the law shows us that. So here, here, here's really the heart of God is revealed then that he saves sinners by sending his son. He sent the Messiah, right? He gave Abraham the promise, not the law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he gave Abraham the promise because the promise is that he's sending the mediator, okay? Yes. He, right? Yes. The law was mediated to Israel by, by Moses century later. But the law was not in, or is not in conflict with the promise that God made to Abraham. Amen. In fact, the law confirms that salvation can be obtained only by faith in Christ, not by keeping the law. Mm -hmm. If it had been possible for the law to save sinners and to give them eternal life, then righteousness and salvation would have come by the law. That's right. what he says in verse 21. Right. Instead, the scriptures reveal that all are under sin, verse 22, and therefore it's necessary that the seed of Abraham, that the Lord Jesus Christ, must come to bring salvation. Amen, amen. So the difference between choosing to live for Christ, or excuse me, the difference between choosing to live by faith in Christ or choosing to pursue righteousness through legalism is the difference between success and failure. Right, right. You want to succeed, then you choose faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. You want to fail, then you choose legalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We obtain the promises of God through faith in Christ, not by legalism. We can succeed, we can succeed at being spiritual, being righteous, being spiritually mature as Christians but only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith in Christ, we lose our freedom to be spiritual, we lose yes. our righteousness, yes. and we lose our spiritual maturity. Only by faith in Christ can we have righteousness, can we have peace, and can we have joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. What Romans 14, 17 tells us. So, God said to Abraham, I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing. Genesis 12, 2. So as disciples of Christ, God blesses us so that we, in turn, will be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. So what is our call? What is, what is our discipleship step that we make this week? Is that we always seek, in all ways, to be a blessing to others. Not because of ourselves, Amen. but because of Amen. Christ and what he's Amen. done for us. So we, like the Galatians, we have received the Holy Spirit into our lives by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we then need to pray for one another that we can live Holy Spirit-filled lives mm -hmm. and that we will be enabled by the Holy Spirit to be effective witnesses there you go. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. So today, I pray... That, Lord, you bring your word mm. into fulfillment Hallelujah. of understanding in our hearts and our minds. Yes. We thank you, Lord. Father, Lord, that that uh, uh, we are not like the Galatians in the sense that we are giving up our hope and giving up our faith and trying to obey a law. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for what Paul said in chapter 3 is a reminder to us that, Lord, uh, that, that there's nothing we can do to earn our relationship oh, amen, with you, amen, but yes. that it is all done by yes. you. Yes. It's already been accomplished, and Father, it's all by our acceptance, by faith in what you've done. So we thank you for that, and we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can live by faith. Amen. In Jesus' amen. name, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. See you next week.